This is the chapter overview video for chapter 16, Waves. So we cover chapters 16 and 17 this week, covering waves um, and other wave phenomena like superposition, uh, standing waves. So, uh, so this is the first of those two chapters. And uh, it covers uh, standard descriptions of waves that are um, that you will also see in lecture. Um, um, so that's a section 16.1, traveling waves. This is the a very basic form of wave we work with. You might um, look at, um, so there's some conceptual items here. They are good to know as a like a terminology, you know, how is wave defined in physics? Um, what is mechanical wave and so on? Um, and because they are I, in the lecture, I do talk about like uh, the wave that you do in stadium. Uh, that's not a mechanical wave, but it is a form of wave. You could uh, actually describe it <laughs> mathematically. Um, so, anyways, uh, so read through it for the definition of terms. Now, once you are talking about some, something like a wavelength, you are talking about periodic waves. So, um, in this section, they describe periodic traveling waves. Um, wave velocity, um, that you, doesn't have to be um, um, periodic, but uh, one of the most useful way to relate wave velocity to other quantities is wave velocity related to wavelength and frequency. And these quantities only make sense for periodic waves that have wavelength, have frequency. So yeah, and it also gives you terms like a transverse wave where the displacements are perpendicular, transverse to the direction of propagation, or the longitudinal wave where the displacements are along the same direction as the propagation direction. All these terminologies are good to know, so um, to take a look, read through. I don't think this section is uh, very mathematical. Uh, they save the mathematical material for the next section, mathematics of waves. And the, um, uh, the kind of the place that we start with is a little bit different. So in the lecture, you will see me start from, uh, let's see here, what they call the linear wave equation. Uh, really, I mean, the textbook itself also says it. Um, this is the linear wave equation, which is one of the most important equations in physics and engineering. So in the lecture, we start with that. Um, but I think your textbook takes the same approach that it did with oscillations, which is that it's going to talk about the solutions first. So um, they look at some of the pulses, which are easier to imagine as a kind of a traveling wave. They describe that. Um, pulses like this can be, they are solution to that linear wave equation. And then they talk about the sinusoidal wave. Um, and kind of, I, I think they, they do build up step-by-step step what the mathematical form for that wave should look like. So you look at the shape of the wave and you know you start from that and then you um, build on top of that, okay, uh, uh, with a, so this describes a snapshot of a wave as a function of position, what does that string look like? But with a traveling wave, that shape will now be moving. So they model that moving thing with the replacement of x with this x minus vt. And in fact, um, any function that can be written in this form where the variable or variables of a position and time can be combined in this way will actually form a solution to that linear wave equation. So they introduce these solutions and uh, work through um, some of that um, and define, um, introduce more terms, wave number, that's a really useful term to know. It relates to wavelength the same way uh, angular frequency relates to period. Um, so it's a good wave term to know. Um, and then, yeah, uh, phase, fact, phase shift. Um, did you talk about phase shift? We might not have. Um, <laughs> a phase factor or phase shift, uh, you know, I did talk about it when we were talking about um, the complex exponentials, I think, maybe. Um, if you haven't heard me talk about it, it'll come up <laughs> soon enough. Um, so, so yeah, they start with the solution and then I think there's some things that they talk about that yeah, velocity and acceleration of medium, I, we don't really put emphasis on it. I think there might be one homework question that uh, kind of relates to that. Um, I mean, uh, it's a, 
um, useful physical thing to think about, you know, application of uh, mechanics. Um, but as far as the wave phenomena goes, this is the least interesting aspect of the phenomenon. So um, not that much uh, emphasis there. What is important here is the uh, linear wave equation. And in fact, I guess, um, um, so there is an aspect of this that actually matters, uh, but I will point that out here, where your textbook derives the wave equation for one of the situations. So the importance of a wave equation is not any one particular application. It's that this occurs just uh, in so many different places, in so many different ways. Uh, one of the places where you will see it, if you take Physics 4B with me and stay through the end of the semester, um, when, you, when we cover electricity and magnetism, we come across to something called electromagnetic wave. And you can derive the wave equation for electromagnetic wave using the laws of electricity and magnetism. And so, so again, it, this is, this is a, like a simple harmonic oscillator. One of the reasons we emphasize so much on simple harmonic oscillator is just uh, how many different iterations of that you see across different examples and waves are similar. Um, this equation occurs so many times in so many different iterations that uh, learning how to deal with its solutions, the, some of the uh, interference phenomena, it's uh, something that's going to be useful in many different circumstances. So with that, um, so your textbook gives a, a couple examples actually. This is the one example in chapter 16. Um, that goes through the derivation of the wave equation. So um, uh, now I don't do this in the lecture because uh, each time I try to do that, I make a mistake here and there. So what I will say is that this is a good section for you to um, kind of read through in detail. Having said that, um, you won't see many homework questions on it. But for those of you interested in physics, I do uh, strongly recommend reading through this carefully, you know, set aside the 30 minutes, an hour, give yourself plenty of time to make sure that you understand the each steps in the derivation. Because what they're going to do is they're going to consider a string under tension. And they're going to actually, so this whole semester, whenever we had a string, we treated it as a massless string. Now they are finally going to deal with the mass of the string. And with the mass of the string, they're going to set up a situation where there's some kind of a wave analyze the forces, basically the net force on this segment, and um, they're going to write down the equation of motion the way you would with the, the oscillation. And going from that equation of motion, um, yeah, net force uh, in terms of derivatives, uh, and this is the equation of motion, and by going through the equation of motion, they're going to derive expressions that look like that linear wave equation. So this form here above, that is the specific form of that linear wave equation that just the pops up out of working with the equation of motion for wave on a string. And then you can match that with the general form of the linear wave equation you saw in the previous section. Then you can make this identification that this coefficient here must be equal to 1 over v squared. So 1 over v squared is linear mass density divided by tension, which gives you the formula for the, the speed of a wave on a string. So, so this is the formula for speed of wave on a string, square root of tension divided by the linear mass density. So um, I guess if you just uh, needed a formula out of this section, this is it. I have this formula memorized. So I know how to use it whenever I need the wave of speed of a wave on a string. Um, now, so you know, formula itself, you can always look it up whenever. What is more valuable is uh, the like mathematical maturity to follow through this derivation. So I do highly encourage you, recommend you to give that a try. Um, in the end, what you need for homework is just this formula. <laughs> so with that. Uh, Speed of compression waves in a fluid, um, we skip it entirely. You can read it. Um, I don't think you will see it in homework. We skip it entirely. Energy and power of the wave is another thing that we skip for now. Uh, we will deal with it. Oh, um, 
I usually deal with it when we talk deal with the uh, optics, like uh, intensity of light. So there are some terminologies that are good for you to know. So you know, energy, power. Um, the you know, energy being, uh, well. <laughs> kind of coming from work done and power is rate at which energy changes uh, and in uh, like wave, wave phenomena where things tend to be like distributed out in space um, the useful concept is power per area that we call um, intensity so so there are uh, terminologies that are good for you to know so like um, know that and that's uh, basically it uh, we don't really spend a lot of time with this section so um, do read skim through it so that you uh, learn some of the key terms and then that's it we spend more of this week dealing with interference phenomena because that's where you get a more interesting aspect that where you can see you can use those interesting uh, phenomena to um, to do useful things and uh, I have some um, uh, simulation demos that demonstrate this uh, depending on the boundary condition the reflection is different and uh, as they reflect and come back what happens as they um, as these to combine um, what are they showing um, they should have yeah superposition. So as these two pulses um, kind of overlap in one area, what happens? And what happens is really simple. They just uh, you just add them up. You just add this shape to that shape. You get that. That's it. <laughs> it's really simple. Um, so we give it this grandiose name of principle of superposition. Um, and, uh, so with this principle of superposition, you can see a couple of things. So there are. Um, so uh, I think these descriptions are good to um, read through. Um, the particular examples of superposition principle that uh, you will see is, this I don't think uh, we spend a lot of time, other than me maybe mentioning. Um, so a general wave solution, you can write it as uh, you know sine with a phase factor, or you can write the sum of a sine plus a cosine. And that's what, um, ends up happening what is this you know i don't think this particular example we ever cover it in lecture because what they're driving is something else entirely um, sure <laughs> i mean it's a good trigonometry exercise uh, but you won't see that in lecture um, so in lecture what you will see are a couple examples of uh, wave interference phenomena one of them is standing waves and that's a part of this chapter so Derivation of the expression for standing wave, um, it's fun. <laughs> so what we say standing wave is something that, uh, uh, what is this? I'm not sure what different colors represent. Uh, snapshot of two sine waves. I see, already. So, so what they show in color are the traveling waves. So standing waves can be represented by a sum of two traveling waves. One traveling one way, the other traveling the other way. And as they travel, they overlap in different ways. So when you look at their superposition, the, the black uh, curve here, you see that something is special about it. So here's where it's at the maximum amplitude. And as um, these move out of phase, the amplitude goes down. As the two are completely out of phase, you get a flat um, combined wave. And then later on, they oscillate the other way. Now, as you track it, the point there are points that don't move at all, like 3, 6, 9, 12. They remain at zero for at all points of the cycle. And you can identify antinodes points that move the most. That would be like 1.5, 4.5, 7.5, and so on. So, so when waves form that kind of standing, stationary shape, we call that standing wave. And uh, you can show that mathematically. Um, so your textbook is going through this trig identity to show how you can have a sum of these um, written in a way that it looks like a product of uh, something that shows you the shape of the standing wave, like what we saw there, uh, being multiplied to uh, uh, something that's oscillating in time, so that at different times it could go to you know zero entirely and so on. 
So, so yeah, uh, that's a, uh, and I do as an extra thing uh, with the complex um, exponentials introduced. I think I have some example of trying to drive to the same derivation using complex exponentials. Uh, watch that if you are interested in learning how to use complex exponentials. Um, so, so yeah, standing wave, that's um, one really useful phenomena. It's, uh, um, it's uh, I guess, um, you could measure. Um, so one of the ways in which uh, standing waves are useful uh, in this semester is uh, you get a lot of um, musical things uh, out of uh, standing waves. So I don't think they talk about it in this chapter because I'm suspecting they want to save it until the next chapter, chapter 17, <laughs> when we get there. So but uh, so we talk about standing waves in this chapter, and you will see some examples of uh, that when we talk about sound. And in fact, one of your labs uh, will use standing waves in sound as a way to measure the wave velocity. Uh, 